I'm the Administrative Commissioner for New York, and I'll be chairing the Stripe Bass Board meeting this morning. Welcome to everybody in this bright, beautiful day. And uh, we actually, um, during the Executive Committee meeting yesterday, said we had instructions on how to run a meeting. So we've got them here, how to do it very efficiently. Actually, there's only one thing on here. It says, don't let Tom Foti talk. So, That being said, let's uh, get right into the agenda. Uh, first off, our uh, first action item is uh, board consent approval of the agenda. The agenda should be in your briefing package. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll take that as unanimous consent. Next is our approval of the proceedings from May of 2017. Uh, if you have reviewed those, any changes to our proceedings from our, our last meeting? All right, seeing none, we'll take those with unanimous consent. Um, our next agenda item is public comment. I've had two individuals that have signed up, actually three individuals that have signed up that want to want to speak, so I'll take them in order. Uh, first, we have Bill Goldsboro. These, again, are for topics not on the agenda today, and please keep your comments brief. Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Bill Goldsboro. I come to you today as a private citizen, uh, albeit one who spent many years around this table working on striped bass. My interest today <clears throat> is to, to encourage certain steps that I believe are necessary to continue to grow and strengthen the striped bass population. In that quest, we are fortunate to have some strong year classes in the pipeline from good recruitment in Chesapeake Bay. The 2011 and 2015 year classes are very strong, as you know, uh, and we now have word from the 2017 Maryland Young A Year Survey that this year's spawn was good as well. The concern I have is whether these fish will find sufficient forage to reach their full potential. As we are all aware, striped bass depend heavily on Atlantic menhaden as prey. And to that point, I call your attention to a new paper by Buchheister et al. this year that underscores this dependence by showing a tight correlation between striped bass and menhaden biomass, with both declining with increased menhaden fishing mortality. As you know, the Menhaden Board will be finalizing Amendment 3 next month. It is my hope that ecological reference points will finally be adopted at that meeting that will ensure sufficient forage for striped bass and other predators along the coast. But another decision in Amendment 3 may have greater implications for those striped bass year classes currently maturing in Chesapeake Bay. And my message to this board is not to overlook it. I'm referring to the Chesapeake Bay Menhaden Reduction Fishery Cap. While the ecological reference points are crucial for ecological balance coastwide, the only tool we have to buffer the concentration of the fishery in Chesapeake Bay is the reduction cap. And while Menhaden stock biomass has improved in recent years, most of that biomass is in northern waters, while harvest pressure is concentrated in the Bay region where biomass is relatively low. So there's real potential for striped bass in Chesapeake Bay to be food limited in these coming years. And in fact, recently there have been numerous reports from anglers in Maryland of skinny stripers with no apparent body fat. Whether this condition is related to the wasting disease mycobacteriosis that sometimes plagues the bay has not been determined. But recall that Jacobs et al. 2011 did find that poor diet enhances the progression and severity of mycobacteriosis in Chesapeake Bay striped bass. The bottom line is that the bay reduction cap for Menhaden remains important for striped bass, and it is my hope that this message is carried to the Menhaden Board when it deliberates Amendment 3 next month. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Bill. Good to see you again. Next we have uh, Captain Bob Newberry. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Robert Newberry, Chairman of Delmarva Fisheries. I'm here to discuss today a uh, situation at hand that I believe will be discussed today also is about the problem that we're having in Maryland 
specifically in uh, the northern reaches of the bay with the amount of discard or the B2s and the problem that is arising from that. Um, it's a very, very troublesome situation. I'm, I run a charter service along and, and represent many others in the charter business too that we have seen over the past three years if we have testified here, not on my, myself, but uh, Captain Phil Langley, who's head of the uh, Charter Boat Association, has testified of his concern over the amount of waste of these fish or these B2s. Um, we have put together a group and have addressed this with DNR, um, not here to point fingers or blame on anybody because the old saying is if you point your finger at somebody, you've got three pointing back at you. So I'm just as guilty as everybody else is of participating in this decimation of these fish. What concerns me is I, I would really like to see this commission, when it's addressed today, is to really buckle down and take a good look at this problem because it's not, you know, thousands of fish. It's we're in, we're in the hundreds of thousands of fish that are being wasted. For the past three years, we have had slicks of fish that are one we have a film of this year was two miles wide and three miles long. It had washed up on the beaches of Kent Island. Uh, massive amount of buzzards were feeding on them. Uh, people were complaining about the amount of buzzards. But it, it's not the fact that these fish were skinny and small. It's going after the conservation equivalents for this 20-inch fish. So I would implore the uh, commission that when this is addressed to uh, seriously look at it. Because the one thing that I've said here before in the past three years, and I'm going to say it again, and I just hope it kind of sticks like super glue, is that when a natural resource is politicized, there's only two outcomes from that, is the demise of that natural resource and the demise of the industry based upon that resource. And we're seeing that happen right now. And, you know, the science is there. Um, I think that Maryland should lead the charge on this, which I'm fully sure that they will and working with ASMSC and the other states because if we're going to ensure the longevity of these striped bass and seeing what I've seen over the past three years as a result of uh, addendum four it's it's horrific so once again I, I will repeat myself is that politicizing of a natural resource leads to two problems the demise of that resource and the demise of the industry based around it thank you very much thank you Captain Newberry Last, I have Robert Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me speak. My name is Robert T. Brown. I'm president of the Maryland Waterman Association. We have a large problem in Maryland with discards between, with, since we have a minimum size of a 20-inch rockfish in uh, the state of Maryland. Uh, this all came about back uh, a few years ago when uh, we got a 25 percent reduction on the coast and a 20.5 percent reduction in the Chesapeake Bay. And to uh, meet the criteria to keep fishing, we, we elected that we had a, we went to a 20 inch fish on the sport and charter boats to meet uh, the criteria we had to be fishing legally. So w when this happened, it put, uh, by raising that size limit of those fish and the amount of fish that we have in the bay, you have to catch anywhere from 20 to 50 or 80 fish before you can catch one that's of legal size. And once you hook these fish, especially during the warm waters of the summer, we have a lot of fish that die. And these dead discards have been floating all up and down the bay. They've been floating and going ashore in different places. It's not because they have a lack of feed. It's because we have so many fish in the bay at this time. And we have two or three more year classes that I'm glad to hear that we have. But we're, the abundance of rockfish that are in the bay is becoming overwhelming. Uh, what I'd like to, uh, hopefully, I just want to make everybody aware of this so we can do something to stop this. Because it is a waste of the resource when you can't catch it all the time and uh, keep it. You're better off to go out and catch a, f a few fish, catch a quota, go back in. It's better for business than catching all these fish and have these discards. And I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> Any other public comment before we get into the rest of the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go right into item four. 
We're considered 2017 fishery management plan review and state compliance report, and Max has got a presentation for us. Max. Thank you, Chairman. So this is the 2017 FMP review for striped bass. The reporting period is the 2016 calendar year. Quick overview of my presentation, uh, touch on the status of the stock and the status of the fishery, move on to status of management measures and wrap up with compliance and review team recommendations. Based on the results of the 2016 stock assessment update, Atlantic striped bass is not overfished, overfishing is not occurring. In 2015, spawning stock biomass was estimated at 58,853 metric tons, which is just above the threshold. Fishing mortality estimated at 0 0.16, which is below the threshold and the target. And as we're all uh, likely aware, the benchmark is currently underway. Peer review is expected at the end of 2018. This is a look at spawning stock biomass over time. Uh, this is figure one from the FMP review report. Uh, what you can see is a, 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 a exponential increase almost from the beginning of the time series. And then it crosses the threshold at 1995, which is not coincidentally the uh, definition of that threshold is that value it continues on to a peak in around 2003 and then since, since then has been declining um, in 2015 you can see it's, it's, it is just slightly above that threshold level. Moving on to fishing mortality rate over time um, similar trend here in the beginning of the time series as the management plan uh, relaxed regulations. You can see fishing mortality increase to a peak around 2006, 2007, uh, at which point it, it decreased a little bit but has fluctuated right around 0.2. It's crossed the threshold and uh, is currently below the target in 2015. Moving on to status of the fishery. This is looking at the commercial sector. 2016 was an estimate of uh, 4.8 million pounds. This is very similar to 2015. Both of these fishing seasons were under the addendum four quota, so that's not very surprising. Um, commercial landings and uh, discards by state are detailed in tables one, two, and three, uh, but just a couple more points here. <coughs> 60% of the harvest did come from the Chesapeake Bay fisheries, and that discard estimate in 2016 is a little over 400,000 pounds, which is uh, uh, higher than it was uh, last year, but much lower than the year before that. So uh, it's sort of middle of the road. I uh, do have one small correction uh, in the FMP review report. I incorrectly reported the difference between the 2015 and the 2016 landings numbers. It's a very small number um, and very small difference, but just uh, FYI, I'll, I'll make that change in the final version. Moving on to the recreational fishery. So 2016 did mark an 18% increase in total removals compared to 2015. That's in terms of number of fish, and we are talking about harvest and dead discards when we say total removals. The 2016 harvest estimate was a little over 1.5 million fish, which equates to roughly 19.9 million pounds. 46% of that came from the Chesapeake Bay fisheries in terms of number of fish. Our fish released increased um, by 37%, which in that dead discard estimate is 1.04 million fish. Um, so that's the red bars on that figure there. Um, you can see it, it is pretty high over the recent, I don't know, decade or so. But if you move further into the, those peak biomass years in the mid 90s to 2008, it's actually um, on the lower end. So just to put uh, things in perspective. Take a quick peek at the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River stock. Uh, so based on an, a stock specific assessment conducted by North Carolina, uh, this 
AR stock is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. The 2014 spawning stock biomass estimate is a little over 2 million pounds, which is uh, well over the threshold and the target. 2014 fishing mortality estimate at 0 0.06, which is similarly, similarly well below the threshold and target. Um, speaking with North Carolina staff, I was advised to uh, extend caution when evaluating those terminal year stock status estimates for the AR. Um, those are likely over, and it is likely an overestimate of SSB and an underestimate of F considering the retrospective bias exhibited by the AR stock specific model. The magnitude of those values will likely uh, change as additional years of data are incorporated. A uh, quick look at the harvest in the Albemarle Roanoke stock uh, from that region. Commercial harvest was a little over 120,000 pounds. This is a slight increase relative to 2015. And recreational harvest, just shy of 80,000 pounds, also a slight increase from 2015. Moving on to status of management measures, this is a look at the coastal commercial quota. In 2016, Rhode Island had a reduced quota due to overages in 2015. So the uh, total coastal commercial quota was 2.84 million pounds. This was not exceeded. However, there were uh, three state-specific overages, Massachusetts by 6,000, or I'm sorry, 68,927 pounds, Rhode Island by 32 pounds, Virginia by 589 pounds, and those overages will be deducted from the current 2017 quota. Uh, moving to the Chesapeake Bay, there were no deductions from 2015, so the commercial quota stands as it is in Addendum 4. The 2016 baywide quota was not exceeded. Uh, similarly, there were no jurisdiction-specific overages. So now looking at uh, the Juvenile Abundance Index analysis, Addendum 2 defines recruitment failure as a value that is lower than 75% or the first quartile, Q1, of all values in a fixed time series appropriate to each JAI. The PRT, uh, which does include some membership overlap with the technical committee, reviews this juvenile abundance index from six different surveys, and if any of those surveys do fall below its respective Q1 for three consecutive years, appropriate action is recommended to the board. For the 2017 JAI review, the review team evaluated the 2014, 2015, and 2016 values, and there was no management action triggered. This is a very small figure. Uh, however, you can see it much better in your review report. What I'm clearly trying to do is direct your attention to two specific values. In the top right corner, that's the Maryland JAI in the Chesapeake Bay. And then uh, in the middle on the left is from New York in the Hudson River. And those two values in 2016 were below Q1. Um, the previous years in that, those time series were above average. So uh, again, no management action triggered. But if this does continue next year or the year after that, uh, might see some red flags. Status of management measures continues with Addendum 3. This is the commercial tagging program. Um, Addendum 3 requires all states with commercial fisheries to implement a commercial tagging program and to submit annual monitoring reports no less than 60 days prior to the start of their first commercial season. The monitoring report primarily includes a summary of the previous year's tagging program. This includes also tag descriptions for the upcoming season, as well as highlighting any issues with that program. In 2016, all states submitted reports on schedule and implemented commercial tagging programs consistent with those requirements. You can refer to Table 10 in the report, which summarizes each state's program requirements. So wrapping up with compliance and recommendations, the review team reviewed all the state compliance reports and determined that each state and jurisdiction implemented regulations consistent with Amendment 6 and Addenda 1 through 4. 
there were no de minimis requests at this at this time um, and as such the review team recommends the board accept the 2017 FMP review and state compliance reports for Atlantic striped bass thank you mr. chair I'll take any questions thanks Max great report questions John thank you mr. chair thanks for the report Max uh, when you showed that graph of total recreational mortality it looked like the mortality in 2016 was almost equivalent to the mortality in 2014 the last year before then the before went into effect the main difference being that most of the more well not most of it but much more of the mortality was due to discards uh, in 2016 than in 2014 so obviously as many of us thought from the get-go that these reference points were very conservative and as we've been hearing from the uh, charter fishermen from the Chesapeake for the last couple of years we're still killing a lot of striped bass it's just we're not harvesting them so uh, once again I think this points toward the discussion we'll be getting into later on the reference points changing them thanks John uh, John McMurray thank you mr. chairman uh, Max can you put up the uh, SSB chart So that does not include 2016? Correct. The terminal year in the 2016 update was 2015. Thank you. So uh, is there any indication that we're starting to trend up or the SSB is starting to go back up with 2016? I mean, <clears throat> you would think that the 2011s are starting to recruit and you would think some of them would have recruited in 2015 and certainly by now we should be seeing some sort of upward trend so is there any indication that that's happening um, in terms of spawning stock biomass I can't make any interpretations of that for 2016 we haven't put any of that data through the model itself um, clearly there's anecdotal evidence and b2s are higher uh, indicating some catch of smaller uh, non-retainable striped bass so I think that's corroborated but as far as spawning stock biomass and that that estimate includes a lot of other information so it's it's hard to tell what would happen in 2016 thanks one more question uh, well uh, you know fishing mortality seems to be going down pretty precipitously according to, to the chart and you would think uh, you know it wouldn't be all b2s you would have some keeper fish that are starting to recruit so you would assume there would be some upward trend there even in 2015 and I don't know if that's a cause for concern or not um, and I would just note that anecdotally I, there are a lot of complaints this year that we're not seeing the usual uh, abundance and size of fish that we should be seeing this time of the year so it's just something to note, something we should keep an eye on. Thanks. Thanks, John. Dave Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. On the recreational discard mortality, it, I mean, you know, I think I could probably speak on, on behalf of everybody. It's such a waste of a resource. And I guess my question is, to what extent have we uh, had either the PDT technical committee or whatever look at that issue and try to formulate ways to reduce it I mean it it to the extent we can reduce that we can liberalize the catch regulations you know so uh, has, has that been done in uh, in the recent past and if not maybe we could get that done I think those conversations have occurred uh, not explicitly but sort of as part of other exercises that the TC has done um, I think speaking on behalf of the TC and they can I have two members next to me that can chime in if they feel they need to but uh, it's it's a trade-off I mean if you relax regulations you'll keep more and you'll still have some discards and and vice versa so um, if, if if that helps answer your question um, thank you 
Just go ahead, Dave. I, I still think it would be a useful exercise to the extent that the technical committee could weave that into their their assignments and try to bring back recommendations to the board. At least we'd have something to consider. I guess it's a concern, yeah, that, that everybody has with the discard mortality. I think we're going to talk a little bit about it later. Um, we'll see. I mean, they're obviously we'll have discussions on it, but they're pretty well over tasked right now. So are you suggesting we do a something addition or that they just in their deliberations when they're talking about the next stock assessment that they discuss it? Next, next stock assessment. Okay, well, we'll see. Uh, obviously, it's a problem that needs to be addressed, so they'll be considering it somewhat. Uh, Lauren? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to Max for an excellent report, very interesting report. Uh, I'm specifically concerned, as, I, as we certainly all are, regarding the uh, fishing mortality for these discards. And I'm wondering about anecdotal evidence that has been given to me personally, and probably to most of us in the room, uh, concerning two uh, sort of fishing procedures. One is uh, the use or lack thereof of circle hooks. And the second being uh, the inclination or lack thereof for the angler to play out the fish to absolute exhaustion. Uh, it's my understanding that, that those two factors really contribute uh, to uh, mortality. Uh, first part of the question is, am I right? And second is, how can we uh, uh, work out a plan that would, uh, that would lessen this mortality? Thank you. The, the fighting aspect of that is not something I'm going to comment on here, but the circle hooks, yeah, I think some jurisdictions do require circle hooks, and they've been shown to reduce your release mortality rate slightly. Um, I'm hearing down to 5%. Right now, 9% is used in our models. Um, as far as how long an angler fights their fish, and I think that's more of an education outreach type, type discussion. Yeah, I'll just add to it, Lauren. I think that, you know, you go back to the individual states, the circle hooks are definitely an improvement, although they're not a solution because you still foul hook with circle hooks, but still they help out with that mortality. And I think that, you know, angling techniques, whatever, really, it, you know, the states, some of the states do good outreach and education programs. And I think we get, each one of us has to do more of that to kind of reduce the discard mortality. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the re release mortality um, <clears throat> is affected more by the size of the stock, the year classes, um, <clears throat> and anglers' uh, decisions. Um, the charter boats I know, um, if they go out in the morning and they catch, the angler catches his legal keeper or keepers, in, say in the first 15 minutes, and they've paid for six hours, they fish the six hours. They're, they're not coming home uh, after 10 minutes after getting their legal fish. So <clears throat> I, I guess I don't see uh, where changing a size so that the anglers can catch the fish from a charter boat standpoint um, lessens release mortality because I think <clears throat> unless they are able to go target different species. but. Um, and then the size of the fish, if you have a lot of fish that are under size, and especially now in New England, we have a lot of fish that are very small. And there, I mean, there's no way you could have any kind of regulations to keep a 16 inch striped bass along the coast. So, so I think it's more complicated than just saying if we adjusted the size a little bit, then that would take care of a lot of uh, release mortality. Thanks, Richard. Good point. Mike Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had intended to discuss with the board um, the, active, the active role that Maryland is, is going to be taking um, to help address this issue. I was planning to bring it up under new business. I don't know if that would still be more appropriate. Given where this conversation is leading, though, I'd be happy to uh, offer to the board you know, our, our review and intentions uh, in the coming months if, if you think that's appropriate now. 
I think I'd rather stay to other business because I'd like to get this approved and then, you know, we get through those reference points. We'll do it then, Mike. Tom Foti? I guess I'll wait till we have that discussion because I have a few points to make out, make, make in that direction. Any other questions for Max? John McMurray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One more quick question. I'm, I'm a little confused about this discard mortality conversation because uh, having spent the better part of two decades on the water targeting striped bass, those smaller fish, those 18-inch fish, sub-20-inch fish are pretty robust. You have to do a lot to kill them. So unless these guys are fishing with treble hooks and clam bellies, I, I don't understand how we're having slicks of dead fish in the Chesapeake Bay. And my question really is, is the discard mortality in the Chesapeake Bay presumably higher than it is on the coast, or is it flat out 9% across the board? And is there any reason to believe that that's not accurate? The discard mortality rate is the same across the board. There's more fish coming, being caught in the bay relative to the coast. So I think that's why you would see a higher number in the bay relative to the coast. But the release mortality rate, that 9% that that's applied to all catches, um, that stays the same. So it's proportional. It's just uh, you know how many fish are actually coming out of the water. This to this point, Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, you know, to the question asked, and I'm not going to I'm not going to argue that nine percent nine percent is what's used across the board in the assessment, and it's what we plot when we talk about B2s and and the amount of dead discards that come from those released fish. But there is evidence and um, work that has been done in Chesapeake Bay um, that results in mortality as high as 30 percent in some cases, 27, 28, 29 percent. Um, so it has to do with water temperature, it has to do with hook location, um, and, other, and other elements, uh, you know, that go into everyday fishing uh, activity. So I don't want to sit here and think, I don't want the board to think that this 9 percent is something that is across the board. It's, it changes in different, in, in different parts of the, uh, of the coast. Uh, it has a lot to do with the hooks that are used and the baits that are used. Uh, artificial lures are certainly don't have the same mortality that live lining and, and chumming have. Um, and we're seeing that on the Chesapeake Bay. Again, I'm not going to get into details later. I just wanted to brief the board on, Mar on what Maryland has been doing to actively pursue this problem. Um, but I wanted to also make sure the board understood that 9%, while it's used for the assessment, it is not a standard. Uh, and there is evidence that it can be higher than that. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, if I could just jump in and respond to Mike and more info for John. That's, that 9 percent is clearly a, a topic of interest. The Stock Assessment Subcommittee and Technical Committee will be diving into that thoroughly with this benchmark coming up. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that number change. Uh, however, Tom Foti. Yeah, we, Maryland did studies years ago and basically looked at water temperature, looked at air temperature, and looked at a couple other things that are basically affect the mortality. And those figures are out there. The studies there, the technical committee really doesn't need to do anything. You know, it was actually, if the air temperature above 90 degrees, no matter where you're fishing, in the Delaware River or any of those warm water, high, low salinity areas, the hook and release mortality, some places could be as high as 40 percent, we looked at back then. And that's when Jersey Coast started put out information that if you're basic fishing, cook, and release, because we always knew that striped bass, because the behavior of the angle is going to be greater, it was in the early years, greater by hook and reach mortality than catch mortality. I mean, those figures, you can go back and look at it. We were always catching and killing more fish by hook and release than we were by keeping them, you know. And it was, was going to be a natural way that that fishery was uh, uh, played. Unlike summer flounder, which shouldn't be there, striped bass was always there. Now, some of the things that are basically affecting it, you know, when, it is true. When you basically fight with light tackle and you basically stress a fish out in hot water, it goes up. So I recommend to my fly fishermen, you put 20-pound leaders on. You don't use light tackle. If you're out in fishing in the Delaware River and the water's above 80 degrees, you should be using 40-pound tests. Get the fish as carefully as you can to the boat. Don't touch it and release it. 
We put all those things out years ago because those we realized that in hot water, up in low salinity situations, the hook and release mortality is going to be greater. So, yeah, it has a big factor, and it always was going to have a factor. And and Richie's right. When people go out, I mean, I sit on the beach and watch guys fish one striped bass after another during a blitz, and nobody's even taking a fish home, but some of them, their behavior is not what you should be doing to actively and nicely release fish for the highest percentage of uh, protection. Thanks, Tom. All right, we've had good discussion on this. I, th I think, uh, as Max had said, this is going to be looked at in the next assessment, so we're going to we're going to move along, but we're going to need a motion to approve this. Uh, Mike Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the 2017 Fishery Management Plan Review and state compliance for Atlantic Strike Pass. Thanks, Mike. Second by Pat Keller. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, we'll adopt that as unanimously uh, unanimous consent. Okay, we're going to go into item number five. Um, but bi biological reference points, the uh, TC is looking for some guidance on this. Um, we've actually not looked at the reference points since Amendment 6 in 2003. And with the new stock assessment, um, the uh, TC has definitely had some issues they'd like to bring up. So Nicole's going to do a presentation, and then we'll have some discussion on maybe which option we can go with. So, Nicole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today I will be presenting a TC report where the TC and the Stock Assessment Subcommittee are requesting board guidance on Atlantic Strait Bass FMP goals and objectives. I'm going to start by going through some background, including the 2018 benchmark assessment, the current biological reference points used in the current assessment, FMP objectives and acceptable, acceptable risk, and then get into the board guidance that we're seeking. So the 2018 benchmark assessment is currently underway. In fact, we just had our first data workshop in September. And tour number five is to update or redefine biological reference points, including BRPs, point estimates, or proxies for BMSY, SSBMSY, FMSY, or MSY. Define stock status based on BRPs by stock component where possible. The current SSB threshold, as Max pointed out earlier, is the estimate of SSB in 1995, and the target is 125% of that value, and you can see from the figure that while we are well below the target, we are hovering right around the threshold. The current F target and threshold are those that will maintain the populations at the SSB target and threshold. And again, you can see from the figure that F is well below both the target and threshold as of the 2016 assessment. There's a trade-off between preserving spawning stock biomass and allowing fishing. And as we just heard, the board has raised concern that the current biological reference points may be too conservative for various biological, ecological, and socioeconomic reasons, and may be restricting fishing unnecessarily. The current management objectives and acceptable risk levels were laid out in Amendment 6 to the striped bass FMP back in 2003. The TC and SAS posed to the board several questions. Is the board satisfied with the current management objectives and acceptable risk levels as laid out in Amendment 6? Does the board want to manage the stock to maximize yield, maximize catch rates, maximize the availability of trophy fish, and what is the acceptable level of risk when it comes to preventing stock collapse? The TC and SAS recognize that this is not a simple task, and we're not recommending that the board decide these items today. Instead, we're recommending that the board consider one of the following. A formal workshop, such as the Ecosystem Management Objectives Workshop that was done recently for Atlantic Menhaden. Developing a subcommittee of the board. Develop and issue a survey for the board to seek preferred direction for management and preferred balance between spawning stock biomass and F. The TC and SAS could also conduct a full management strategy management evaluation. However, it would not be completed until after the benchmark is complete and peer reviewed. 
And with that, I can take any questions. Thanks, Nicole. Um, we'll take uh, questions for Nicole first. Remember when you ask them and you start thinking about which one of these options we would like to pursue if the board, if it's the board's pleasure. And, and when you make those comments, remember you might be volunteering to sit on one of those things. So, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not volunteering nothing, but <laughs> just a question, and maybe this isn't strictly for Nicole, but you know, perhaps for, for Tony and Bob as well. So I know that one of the items that we discussed last year, and I believe um, the policy board is going to get an update on this uh, from the risk and uncertainty policy working group, but you know, the, the risk and uncertainty policy working group, um, if I recall, was looking at sort of striped bass as kind of their case study for trying to apply um, the draft approach and had spoken of possibly having a commissioner workshop to walk through that. So would these two, in looking at the option for a workshop here to revisit management objectives, would those two workshops dovetail? Has there been any discussion about that? So I seem it's probably less a question for Nicole and more a question for Bob or Tony. Go, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the plan right now with risk and uncertainty is to have a workshop at the February meeting. Um, we were going to do some of that today, but we got into a time crunch. We figured it would be better to put it off until February. and We could really you know, spend some time and focus on it, spend a couple hours at a, at a commissioner workshop. And we're going to – Jason McNamee is kind of the guru of this right now, or at least the messenger. And um, – you know, straight pass is the example, and we may be able to tie some of those together, but, but I don't know if, if the risk and uncertainty policy is going to be mature enough necessarily to, to come, you know, to produce outcomes that can be plugged into this, these straight pass questions. But I think it can shed some light on it, but I don't know if there may be some additional work that still needs to be done uh, specific to striped bass. Katie, go ahead. Right, and just to add to that, so the current risk and uncertainty policy is really um, – sort of a component of a larger policy and we're working on a specific, you know, subcomponent of that which is how do you um, how do you evaluate the risk level for reducing F to a target for example and that sort of assumes that we already have a target and a threshold that we're happy with. And so that's what we're going to work on in February, but I think it's going to open the door for a discussion about how do you set that target and threshold at a level that you're happy with before you go through this risk tree. So I think there is this could be it's they won't be fully complementary, but I think they could open the discussion in a way that might help the working, the striped bass working group um, understand what we're talking about and give them better ideas about what we would want for a reference point discussion from that. Thanks, Katie. Other questions for Nicole? J John? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm just, at this point, you're just looking for not suggestions on the reference points, just how we would, the process of how we would get to considering new reference points as like the suggestion just made by uh, Michelle or a working group or whatever? Is that where we're at here? Yeah, John, that's um, essentially we'd either have a, a working group or we'd have a, uh, a subcommittee of the, of the board to work on it. Or the last option, again, which I don't think is very popular because it's going to delay things, um, you know, quite a bit. So um, it's really those three options we need to look at. Jason? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just wanted to offer um, maybe a, a word of caution, and then I'll, I'll actually give a, a recommendation on some of the questions the technical committee asked, if that's okay. So first, um, just uh, when I was reading through the technical committee report, I, I think the uh, presentation kind of um, – address some of my concerns, but I, I'll voice them anyways. I, I don't want people to walk away from this with the impression that we can set these biological reference points solely based on board uh, objectives and things like, that's an, uh, things like that. That's an element of what should be considered, but, you know, we don't want to presume that we might not be able to, um, you know, develop actual MSY uh, biological refer reference points or things like that. We need to be careful, not think about them as dials that we can turn up and down, you know, to whatever degree we desire. There are population dynamics to consider within that um, calculus. So 
on the actual questions. I, all of the options that were presented, I, I think, are good options. I will say the workshop that we did for Atlantic Menhaden uh, worked out really well. We found that to be productive. And while we haven't necessarily operationalized those objectives we ha and goals, we have used them uh, on occasion in some of our deliberations, whether we know it or not. And I think it set the stage um, for, on, for Menhaden to do some further work, specifically something like an MSE, and that'll be my last quick comment. Um, I think moving towards management strategy evaluation is something um, we ought to do. We should be thinking about it, but we should do it thoughtfully, and I would suggest um, that as a commission across species, we should be thoughtful about which we should start with an example. There's not been a lot of this done in, in our area. I think Atlantic herring is the only example um, that I'm aware of, you know, for the uh, mid-Atlantic New England regions. So um, we want to be thoughtful about that. We want to pick an example that we can work through. Um, and so I just, it's a great idea for straight bass, but we should think about it a little more comprehensively before we um, pop doing an MSE on any specific species. Thank you. Good point, Jay. Doug Graham? I got you. Yeah, I, you know, I've, my experience with MSE uh, with herring is uh, um, it has some potential, uh, although there is a lot of analytical work that uh, the technical committee has to do uh, to provide these different, uh, once we come up with ideas, to provide the analysis for this. Um, um, and um, obviously, as the technical committee indicated, um, MSE would be something that would have to be taken up after uh, the stock assessment, um, if we were going to go that way. That being said, I think to start get the board discussing this, you know, potentially a, a, a workshop leading to a subcommittee that would take the results of the workshop um, and try and uh, work on it. But at the same time, again, we may need some analysis uh, of what, uh, whether we go with uh, what would have, what kind of uh, harvest rates, we, harvest would we be looking at with uh, a yield being maximized versus um, uh, maximizing uh, trophy fish. You know, what, what's the difference? And, and to be honest with you, we've kind of been down this road, and I think we all know that we have um, different parts of the coast requiring uh, uh, or asking for different management objectives on this, and, and that's going to be the tough part for us to, to work out some kind of a, a, a compromise that would work for everybody. So that's, at least in the short term, I'm looking at a workshop uh, suggesting wor a workshop uh, moving into a subcommittee work. Thanks, Doug. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think all three. I think you start with a workshop, you take the results of that and go to a subcommittee of the board, and then I think that then ends up sending a survey out to the whole commission so that you, you have more feedback to it. And I think an important piece, um, especially for the subcommittee of the board, is to have um, the different reference points uh, worked out roughly, described, and then given the present stock, how that might be interpreted into regulations so, so that people can more fully understand the impacts of, of, the, of the three different options. <clears throat> Thanks, Rich. Mike Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm happy to hear that the biological refer these reference points are something that are you know, being raised to this level of importance. I've always been one that has thought that the current targets that are set for spawning stock biomass are set to, to a point where it, they're unachievable. They're, they may be achievable, but they're, we're unable to maintain them, and it sets a false expectation for, for fishermen along the coast. So I'm happy to to hear that this is being um, considered at the, at the level that it is. And I also agree with Doug and Richie that, you know, a workshop uh, followed by a subcommittee of the board is, 
is probably the best plan forward in helping to advise the, uh, the TC and SAS on this. And unlike my counterpart from North Carolina, I will certainly offer my services to, uh, to the subcommittee if you choose so, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sounds like a throwdown, Michelle, but uh, <laughs> hey, I'll get you in a second. I got uh, Pat Kelleher first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I certainly don't have any um, problem with uh, what is being recommended here. There have been a couple of comments about uh, um, MSE management strategies, and I would caution the board uh, the, regarding the complexity of uh, management strategies. Amendment 8 for herring at the council, during the council, has been a, a very long process. My initial read um, is it's not showing any appreciable benefits to the, to the predator component um, associated with um, those ecosystem-based approaches. Um, so before we started down that road, I think we should all understand better what that would entail in, in the process and the length of the process that it would entail. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Michelle, and it's good to see you so warm, because last year at this time, I could see a little face at the end of the table huddled in wool, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not to be outdone by my colleague from Maryland, um, I would, of course, be happy to participate in any subcommittee that was developed to ensure a full representation of the range of Atlantic striped bass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So. I'm, I'm fine with all of these things, with proceeding down this track, but if we do decide to revise the goals and objectives that were established in Amendment 6 and put an emphasis on, on yield at the expense of opportunity, I'm pretty sure that needs to be at least an addendum, possibly an amendment. I know that's how we do things at the Council when we want to revise the goals and objectives, and, and we certainly don't have the time for that uh, as far as providing input to the stock assessment folks. Um, my concern really here is that the public get a chance to weigh in on this, because I could tell you with some certainty that the New York recreational fishing public is not going to be okay with taking on more risk. Um, so we really do need to consider the public when we do this. John, you know, they, and the meetings will be open to the public, so as we go through this process, they, they will have input through, through the process. So for that. Mike Onshaw. I'm actually thrilled that the TC is, is pushing this. Um, in my mind, this board has never explicitly stated what they want this fishery to look like. And, you know, it can be commercial, it can be rec, um, but those are very different. And I think a lot of the angst that this board goes through is because there's commercial fighting wreck and bay fighting coast. We all have different interests, and I think we need to go through a process to explicitly say what we want it to look like. And I also think we're in a very good spot. We have a few good years locked and loaded. We have an F of 0.16. I, I don't see the critical need of banging out an assessment. If, if MSE is the way to get us in a place where everyone can manage things better, then I'd be happy delaying the, uh, the assessment, or at least getting the peer review or something like that. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on MSE. I defer to others. If, if that was the best way to do this, I mean, uh, I see a, a survey of the board as that's just a bunch of opinions. Uh, I'd love to see some quantitative things put on it and a whole bunch of different looks evaluated. Um, so anyway, but this was supposed to be questions for Nicole, so that the MSE process would be about how long? Long. Yeah, not, not an insignificant. See, essentially what the MSE process is doing is a sort of a simulation of running the, asset, running the assessment model in parallel with some um, with different economic or, or yield objectives and to be able to evaluate under this 
set of reference points. This is what the fishery would look like. This is what the stock would look like. This is the kind of yield. This is the kind of risk level you would see. And so it's a fairly complex process and would require building additional model on top of the stock assessment model. So I think there is, there's probably a, a middle ground in terms of doing um, a full-blown management strategy evaluation versus having the TC evaluate a few key reference points to say, you know, we want to look at the, the yield and the biological status for maybe three or four different objectives and evaluating some of that. And there may be time after the assessment for a more full back and forth with the TC in terms of you guys saying, this is, we like this, we don't like this, can we see this option? But we want to going forward with the assessment, we don't want to do that as part of the assessment. We'd like to have some firmer guidance from the board in terms of, of how to set up one or two reference points that you guys might want to look at as opposed to the full range of, of options that are out there. Robert Riley. Mike, can you hit the mic? Thank you, so I'll talk about Mike from here. Uh, not to disagree, but if we go back to the underpinnings of Amendment 6, exactly what one of the central themes was, was what do you want this fishery to look like? And if you remember, there was an extension in that process because one thing everyone wanted to do was have a uniform size limit throughout the coast and the bay at 24 inches. And then it was discovered, oops, the allocation that originally was established for Amendment 5, which was 51 percent Chesapeake Bay area, 49 percent elsewhere, was disrupted markedly. Um, and that was just a glitch. But beyond that glitch, there was a lot of talk about what should this fishery look like, which is a great thing to ask of all our fisheries. So um, I certainly support Mike and saying it's a great thing. Uh, concerning the MSC, I tend to think Pat is right, depending on how it's done. Um, could make a difference, as Dr. Drew has stated. You know, there's a lot going on now with risk assessments leading to, uh, you know, a management strategy evaluation. Um, and I know I've looked into this to some extent, and it can be really overwhelming. So, uh, you know, we, we should probably think about that a little bit. Um, I think the practical approach that Dr. Drew mentioned to sort of get some guidance, that's really what we should look for rather than hang our hats on the outcome of an MSC. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all the suggestions I've heard this morning. Uh, it isn't clear to me what the timing of this would be. In other words, if, if we undertake this workshop, um, what's, what is the intended timing relative to the benchmark stock assessment? And, and once I get an answer to that, I'd just let me add that um, we've been at wrestling with striped bass for a long time, and uh, getting our hands around what everyone wants proved to be challenging back in the 1990s, and it continues to be a challenge, and just point out a little historical perspective on that. It's difficult to get everyone to agree on what they want for the status of a straight bass stock. Thank you. That's a good question, Roy. Um, go ahead, Mike. Max. Yeah, thanks for that question, Roy. Um, so talking with my colleagues on timing, obviously, the benchmark is underway, so the earlier the team can get that guidance, the better. Um, considering December, January is tough to convene a workshop, and that seems like the route that this board wants to take. Um, was hoping maybe a webinar would be possible for a first stab at a workshop, and then maybe in February uh, we can get a more folk. Uh, localized number of uh, members for a subcommittee, um, and then moving forward with that, trying to have final guidance from that subcommittee uh, as early as August or May. Um, I think that's the, the ballpark timeline we're hoping for here. Again, the peer review is 
at the end of 2018. Um, so obviously the stock assessment team is going to be exploring some, some models between uh, now and May, um, and then at that time we would need some, some strict guidance. Go ahead, Roy. It sounds, if I may summarize, it sounds like these two tasks will be occurring simultaneously, in other words. Um, this workshop will be convening while the um, benchmark stock assessment is underway. Am I correct in that? Yes. Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a comment and then a question. Uh, since I believe I heard uh, Michelle uh, volunteer to be chair of the subcommittee, and since she did that, I'll be willing to serve on the subcommittee as well. And the, the question is, um, it, will it take an addendum or an amendment to change uh, the reference points? <clears throat> Go ahead, Bob. It's sort of a, at the pleasure of the board. The amendment six allows reference points to be changed through an addendum, but it's you know, changing reference points and evaluating or, or asking the public what do you want this fishery to look like and those sorts of things are pretty big questions. So the board may want to, you know, consider a more lengthy amendment process and, and do some scoping hearings and then a, then a final round of hearings. So it's really, it's really up to the board as to how much public involvement and how many times they want to go out to the public and talk to them about these, these range of options. Um, just, you know, this conversation is very similar to what, what happened in 2002 when Amendment 6 was developed. You know, we were going around, you know, trying to figure out what you want the fishery to look like. There's competing needs and trade-offs, and, um, you know, there was a working group form. Pat Kelleher was actually on it as the AP chair at the time, so he's changed jobs and done, doing different things. I think he's the only one that's left around here that was on that. But ultimately, the board ended up going out to public hearing with a threshold, of, uh, an F rate threshold that was set, as Jason mentioned, on the biological parameters of these animals. And then the targets, they, at the time, was 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and 0.3. That ran, you know, those three options were taken out to public. And, you know, there were, there were a series of, of figures that went along with each of those options that showed what your yield would be, what the, you know, you know eight and older fish would look like, and, and different things. So, you know, it was a very, very direct question to the public in 2002. Uh, and um, you know, what do you want this fishery to look like? And and here here's the trade-offs, and, and it was you know at that time illustrated really well. Um, and and I think you know seems like we're heading down a similar path where we're going to have some level of development of those different options and trade-offs at at the board level. And then as John was saying, go out to the public and say, all right, here's your trade-offs. What do you guys? What do you want? Okay, I guess we'll figure that out as we move along. Um, Let's see, next I have, oh, so um, is there any objection to Michelle chairing the, uh, only kidding. <laughs> uh, I got Jay, Jay McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will, um, I got a little excited with all the MSE talk, so I'll, I'll rein that in a little bit um, to, so you can keep this meeting moving along. Uh, but just uh, maybe a comment. I, I'm not sure if the formal workshop is still on the table as well. And I just want to remind people the construct of that, that workshop, um, it was pretty diverse. And so they looked outside of, you know, it was outside of the board. Um, they brought in folks from the industry, bait and reduction, and uh, folks uh, from NGOs and things like that. So keep that in mind. That's how you get that really good comprehensive feedback uh, in those workshops is to think outside of the kind of narrow universe of, um, what your normal working uh, committees are. Tom Foti. Uh, I'm willing to say serve on Michelle's committee also. Um, if you get 10 striped bass fishermen in the room and you get 10 climate change people in the room and you would find in the climate change maybe get 48 to 52 percent is in agreement and in the striped bass we get 10 percent because nobody could agree with each other. I mean, that's usually when you get 10 striped bass fishermen when you come in rules and regulations. Um, yeah, I'd be willing to participate in the workshop. But the other thing I've been, Rob reminded me, and I, I thank you, Rob, for reminding me. When back in the 90s when we did this, the uh, coast, we assumed that Chesapeake Bay was doing 85 or 75 percent of the contribution to the coastal migratory stocks. Well, as the years progressed, and that's when Delaware really had, you know, 
a lot of still had a lot of problems left. There was not a big stock of striped bass being re, 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 reproduced in the, in the Delaware River. That has changed over the years. And some years, the De Hudson River and the Delaware River make a bigger contribution than the 5 or 10 or 15 percent that we assumed years ago. And it's estimated maybe up to 30 percent or 40 percent. And I've been calling for a workshop on that for many years to find out what is the actual contribution from the Chesapeake Bay, what is the uh, actual contribution from the Delaware River, and what is the actual contribution from the Hudson River. It would help us better manage the stocks to basically do that and fairly manage the stocks. Um, so I'm looking for that workshop. I've been waiting for it for about, I guess, since the Delaware River recovered. So hopefully that would put on an agenda, too. Thanks, Tom. Uh, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this sounds like a lengthy process. We've already been under the addendum four reference points now for three years. Um, you've heard from the fishermen in the Chesapeake and from the Chesapeake states the problems that this addendum is causing the Chesapeake. And as Thomas pointed out, we're having similar problems in the Delaware. I'd just like to know if there's any way that we could speed this process up, because uh, I think that when we took a 25 percent cut on a stock that was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring, that was a big cut. And at this point, there's going to be no relief to uh, the states and the producer areas until, what, 2020 at this rate? Um, I think, John, at this point, maybe, you know, I, I, yeah, I have that concern, too. But I think the workshop, you know, we'll get that going, and, with, and Max had said, and maybe we can, you know, we get better time frames after we get that done. I mean, now it sounds like we were looking for one of three options. Now we might be doing all three. But let's get through the workshop, I think, and then we'll figure that out after that point. Um, sorry, I believe I had, Adam, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Thank you. So building on that lengthy process comment in the TC's memo, they requested guidance by the May board meeting. Can we accomplish that with these tasks? I think would be my first question. And then the second question I had for the TC in this document, I found it noteworthy that in the similar parag same paragraph where they outlined their requested timeline, they highlighted the acceptable level of risk when it comes to preventing stock collapse. Now, most of the work that we do when we look at our reference points is to prevent overfishing, which is in large part a function of a management decision, a desired target biomass trying to achieve. But that element of acceptable level of risk when it comes to preventing stock collapse, I'm not sure we really have any level of risk for allowing stock collapse. We have level of risk for achieving targets or thresholds, but I'd love some clarity on what guidance we would provide there preventing stock collapse. I was really struck by that. I wasn't expecting to see that in the document. So those two questions, one, is the May board meeting a critical timeline and this element of acceptable level of risk of stock collapse versus just achieving some target or threshold? So in, in terms of the timeline, May would be ideal for us in order to really fully, um, in order to get that guidance as soon as possible. But we do recognize that this is an incredibly complex issue and there's a lot of moving parts and um, stakeholder considerations that have to go into it. If we, you guys provided us some guidance by August, that would still allow us, we're planning on having a second assessment workshop at that point, and that would allow us to fold in those objectives at that point. Um, and I think that we outlined this timeline so that we could develop reference reference points that could go to peer review and be available for management use as soon as that peer review is complete at the end of the year. So if you guys, you know, and we may not, and so when you're, when we're putting this workshop together or when you guys are participating in this, we may have to come to recognize that the, um, that there may be no solution that makes everybody happy, but if you could provide us with some rough guidance um, to keep things moving forward, that would be great. Um, I think in terms of, so in terms of the timeline, August is, would still work for us if we need to get some kind of rough guidance at that point. Um, 
in terms of the stock collapse question, I think you're, you're right in the sense that we try to manage two targets and things like that, but I think there is an implicit, when you're setting those targets and thresholds, there is an implicit question of how risky do we want to be? And so I think that has come up certainly at the board level of talking about, okay, we've set this threshold for SSB, at the 1995 level where the stock was in great shape and that implies a minimal risk if you go below that of anything negative happening to the stock. And so, but the question then becomes if we relax that, if we become less conservative, if we allow a lower threshold to allow more fishing pressure, then when you go below that threshold, you're in a riskier position. And so I think it's a matter of, it's not just a matter of saying, okay, we're going to lower the biomass threshold so we can have more, allow more fishing pressure. You have to recognize that that comes with risks. And the board should tell us what level of risk are you comfortable with in terms of setting that threshold and setting those targets so that you can balance the trade-offs between how much fishing pressure you allow and how much uh, spotting stock biomass you preserve in order to buffer that potential risk. So when you drop below the threshold, when the threshold is high, that is a less risky action or a less risky occurrence than when you drop below the threshold when the threshold is low. And so that's, we would like guidance on the board in terms of, of some of those questions because there's obviously different levels that you could set that SSB target and threshold at depending on what your management objectives are and what your level of risk you're comfortable with. So there is there is a, an, an assessment of risk implicit in all of these questions, and it, it's, we just want to make that explicit. Okay, David, you have cleanup. See, I didn't make any baseball references today until now, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to avoid that one for the moment. Uh, so determining the, the management strategy or philosophy that best represents the stakeholders is, is obviously something that that's the heart of what we need to do. It's, it's what we do to come here and sit at the table. We have reference points. We need to stay between them. And in doing so, what works for the people that will be out there? And, and it's going to be different uh, up and down the coast. There's going to be different groups and whatnot. But understanding that, how difficult this is going to be, it's going to take time. So I, I guess my question would be, uh, as mentioned earlier in one of the, uh, the earlier presentations, to change things would just simply be trade-offs at this point. And those trade-offs in my mind would be throwing dead fish over the boat versus keeping them and maybe building a little more confidence in the process. Are there any recommendations that might work in the interim that we are capable of instituting in the short term that might achieve those goals? You know, again, turning some discards into landings, building a little confidence in the process and buying us some time until we get some of this very difficult stuff hammered out. Thank you. I don't believe, David, there's anything we could do short term. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a problem we all are concerned about, but I think this is probably going to be the quickest way to get to it. So, um, so I think from if it's the pleasure of the board sounds like we want to go ahead with a, a, a working group, a workshop first, and um, I think that would, you know, eventually get into some subcommittee. Uh, I think the working group, we charge that, um, I'm sorry, the workshop today, that they uh, will refine a timeline and we'll see how well we can do in terms of aligning with the stock assessment. So um, unless I hear any objection to that, I think we'll proceed with that. We'll start with the workshop and uh, I don't think we need a motion for this. We can just decide to do it, but Tony's raising her hand. So go ahead, Tony. Okay, Bob. A quick question. Is, is the idea that the workshop would be during one of our quarterly meetings? Just. That it's a budget question. Yeah, I, uh, Max and I were just talking about it. I, I kind of like the idea of maybe doing a, um, you know, some kind of a, a call first to kind of frame that out, and then we'll see how the, you know, we can talk about the budget at that point to see how involved it's going to be. Everybody okay with that approach? Okay, seeing none, we'll proceed that way. We'll start with getting a workshop together, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda. Um, we actually have a unique thing. We have to elect both a board chair and a vice chair because, um, well, Russ Allen is actually, if you haven't heard, is going to be retiring and, you know, he volunteered to be vice chairman and uh, 
all knowing that he was going to be retired. No, I'm kidding. So, um, so in any event, we need to get uh, both a, a chair and a vice chair. So do I have any nominations first for chairman? Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> this clearly is a great honor having to nominate two instead of one. So the, the slate that uh, I nominate will be Mike Armstrong for chair and Michelle Duvall as vice chair. And she certainly is stepping up to the plate recently. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. Are there seconds that motion? Russ Allen, seconding that motion. Very good. <laughs> Are there any objections to uh, those two nominations? Seeing none by unanimous consent, uh, congratulations to our new chairman, Mike Armstrong, and our new vice chairwoman, Michelle Duval. Okay, we're up to other business, and uh, Mike, you wanted to bring up uh, a topic on that mortality discard, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, I, and I'll be very brief. Um, I wasn't anticipating the discussion that we had earlier, which I'm ha I was happy to have, and I'm glad that a number of the board members here, we, we all should be very concerned over, over dead discards. It's a, it's a wasteful product of the work that we do, and um, it's been brought to our attention not only through the science and through MRIP, uh, but it's being brought to our attention every day by folks in the field, um, those fishermen who are experiencing this and seeing this firsthand. So I just wanted to um, bring the matter up here today and to inform the board of the active role that Maryland is planning to participate in to help remedy this situation in Chesapeake Bay. So now that Mike's the new chair, I'll take the opportunity to disagree with you that there's not an interim process that we can go forward with. Um, we can't wait anymore. We can't wait till 2020 or 2021, however long this process is going to take uh, for there to be some change to uh, the, the, uh, what we feel is a, you know, a, a very serious problem, a very serious trend in, in dead discards and waste um, in this fishery. So you know, we are going to take an active role, I've, I've mentioned that, and we've reviewed the Commission's guidance on conservation equivalency. And it is our intention at this time uh, to work internally with our stakeholders to put forth a conservation equivalency program for the 2018 uh, summer fall season for next year. And um, you know, in review of that guidance, uh, what we are hoping for, Mr. Chairman, is that we can we could work uh, through through Mike uh, in the coming months and through staff to. Um, have TC review uh, prior to the end of this year, and we would really hope that we could get on the agenda for the February meeting to address that proposal uh, and, and discuss how we could begin, um, at least in the interim between now and the benchmark process, look at trying to solve or at least correct the problem of turning dead discards into harvest. And, you know, I'd appreciate, you know, if anyone has any questions, I, I don't have, I'm not going to get into any details at this time. Just wanted to make the board aware of our intentions moving forward, and we hope that um, we'll be able to have this opportunity in February to, to uh, discuss the proposal. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I just got a text from, from Mike. He withdrew his name from chairmanship. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get a lot into this, but Tom, do you have a quick comment? Yeah. Um, when we did this in 94, 92, when we started opening the fishery up, there was a lot of education of how to hook and release fish, both bluefish and striped bass. Well, that's a long time ago, and we have a lot of new anglers in. Plus, back then, we could communicate through newspapers, magazines, and articles. Well, nowadays, you've got to do it in blogs, YouTube, and a whole bunch of other methods. What we really need to do is reach out, make some new videos that we can post online, to basically how to actively cook and release bluefish, striped bass, and many other species, like the effort New Jersey tried to do with uh, summer flounder. And we're hopefully going to continue that effort with other species over the years. And I think it's about time for the commission to start looking at that. We had these workshops back in the 90s. I think Pat Culhert remembers attended before he got involved in fisheries management, attending those workshops, and how we could get at this to their anglers and their customers. So we, should need, we need to start doing that. But we also need to look at other means of communication because 
The newspapers are no longer there. They don't write, write those articles anymore like they used to. And the magazines are the dying breed, so we have to really look at other forms of communication where the young people do it. Thanks, Tom. Okay, Richie White, you get the last comment. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. <clears throat> um, I, I would just um, recommend to the technical committee in this process that um, they um, do all they can to uh, help, help Maryland uh, try to achieve what they're trying to accomplish <clears throat> and that they, if Maryland comes forward with a proposal that doesn't quite meet muster, that the technical committee will try to <clears throat> give alternatives and advice as to how uh, Maryland could reach uh, what they're trying to accomplish. So I, I'm not sure whether that's normal in the technical committee, if the technical committee just declines and then asks the state to come reapply um, or whether they do give alternatives, but I, I just think that that's important that we um, <clears throat> try to do all we can, that we don't go down the road that we've just recently been down. Thank you. Thanks, Richie. Okay. Um, just the last item we have before we adjourn is uh, I have to do my swan song speech because this is my last um, meeting as chairman. It's uh, been an honor and a pleasure serving for the last two years. Uh, I think we're leaving ourselves in good hands with Mike and Michelle. Um, and I just wanted to um, say for all you folks that have never sat up here, we really don't know what we're doing. It's really the staff that keeps us uh, well balanced. Um, so uh, my, my congratulations to uh, particularly, you know, Max, um, Nicole, and Katie. They just do an outstanding job as do the staff. And remember, Max is a, he's only been here a couple of years. I mean, we used to, like, so we got some new folks along with Megan, whatever. These guys are the, the best of the best of what we have here. So we appreciate them. And I'd give them a round of applause. And unless there's any other business to come before the board, I'll take a mo oh, okay, uh, sorry, Tony. Okay, uh, we, we are adjourned, and Tony's got the microphone. We'll start policy board at 9.35 to allow everyone to check out. And we are aware that it's warm in here, but it is my super secret ploy for Michelle Duvall and I to stay warm all day long. Um, <laughs> it is. Um, they are working on fixing the AC. Apparently it is. Um, it's broken. Yes. <laughs>